All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Man, Buns, and Jesus. We're in season three, but I'm refusing to give these to this episode and our previous episode a number. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Laborious from Edgewater Lutheran Church in Eastvale, California. And the other gentleman on this call, who doesn't have his hair in a man bun right now, but if you're listening, that doesn't much matter to you, the Reverend Benjamin Oschlager. How are we doing today, Ben? We're doing good. We're feeling spicy. Uh, throwing some hot takes out there. Um, we're in the midst of kind of a, a two-part mini-series of hot takes that aren't actually that hot or takey. Um, or takey. We're, we're responding to other people's Pretty hot sure takes. Pretty sure that's not a word, More man. Than, I'll deal with it. Um I am by you telling you tell it's not a word. That is how I have chosen <laughs> to deal with it. Anyway, um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, as we're recording this podcast, there's been a little bit of controversy around an annotated uh, large catechism that the uh, LCMS is publishing arm, Concordia Publishing House, aka CPH has put out. And uh, last week we dove into one of the two issues that um, really kind of flared up temperatures and anger around this publication over what was in certainty a nothing burger. Um, (laughs) And uh, that was around issues of of sexuality. Um, And this week we're going to look at the other issue that has been probably most cited um, in the shouty corners of the internet. um, (laughs) Shouty corners of the internet. I'm going to use that one. Uh, uh, And that that's around the topic of self-defense. And this one, this one I think was interesting because it speaks to the way that the church has been shaped by uh, American culture rather than vice versa as people kind of want it or hope it to be. Um, and so we're going to dive into this a little bit today. Josh is on a bit of a, a, an adventure in self-discovery um, as we talk about this himself. Um, but I think this will hopefully be helpful as we dive into some of the things around uh, self-defense and in our theology on it and um, also some of the cultural influences that shape the way that a lot of Christians think about the issue um, so first and foremost Josh do you have the uh, the article up in front of you uh, I do the esteemed Reverend Dr. Joel D. Bierman yeah so as with last week I read I read all three articles and this is dealing with the uh, um, the fifth commandment which is thou shalt not murder uh, and I read all three articles and again I I was like I don't I don't see what the issue was like because the issue purportedly was self defense and I couldn't I couldn't find that it wasn't really addressed except and i'm going to pull a couple quote and second of all i think the i again this is i think this is the article that was an issue i'm not entirely sure um but it was an article by joel bierman who is a systematics professor at the seminary and like if you're disagreeing with joel bierman about theology you are probably not correct (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you like. I'm not saying he's infallible, right? He says things. So, sometimes he says things that uh, maybe go a little too far. Maybe he he says things that uh, you can Josh disagree and I love with. The guy, and we've disagreed with him on some things. But by and large, especially if it's something he's comf- he's confident enough to write an article about. You're probably not the one who's in. The- anyway, so digressing from my uh, my life of, of Dr. Bierman's work, he writes the resultant 
he's kind of talking about because the title of his article is uh now i now i want to look it up to make sure i get it it's lawful legal for lawful lethal force so what he's writing about because it's you shall not commit murder he's writing about the lutheran theology that the government is given the sword so in in in, in situations of war uh, a christian can in good conscience serve as a soldier and and kill people as a soldier uh the government has the authority to to administer the death penalty um so that's what he's talking about at, at its core he's talking about why like explaining our theology on why it's okay for the government to do these things and he says that he addresses this he says the resultant paradox of a christian humbly following christ in a way of non-retaliation self-sacrifice and turning the other cheek while at the same time wielding a sword in battle has caused no end of angst among Christians of other traditions. And then you, you go on and he says, and Christians with a grasp of the wonder of grace, a commitment to serve the other faithfully within their vocations and an aversion to the self-serving abuse of power are excellent, excellent candidates for serving in government. He says, this is not to imply that the interface of personal cheek turning and vocational soul sword wielding is easily navigated and lived far from it practicing this doctrinal truth in real life can be exceedingly complicated and even painful and different christians will reach different conclusions about the best way to sort the distinction out in practice so he is writing here that there's there's some there's muddy water here it's difficult to navigate um and then he kind of is concluding the article and he says the recognition of a legitimate place for the use of the sword within God's plan for his creation is not a license for any Christian to use the sword for any reason unilaterally deemed legitimate and necessary. And it certainly does not provide a scriptural foundation for a right to bear arms. And I'm guessing that is what people got touchy about because people are really touchy about the right to bear arms, which is like let's distinguish here the right to bear arms is a constitutional reality not necessarily a scriptural one i don't think it inherently is non-scriptural but it you would it would take some work for you to convince me that the bible says we must have the right to bear arms so that's those are the quotes i kind of pulled out from beerman's article that say like i guess you could find issue with this um my my pro and ben maybe you can clarify this a little bit um so he references turning the other cheek which comes from matthew 5 and it said and this is jesus teaching he says you've heard it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say to you do not resist the one who is evil if anyone slaps you on the right cheek turn to him the other also if anyone would sue you and take your tunic let him have your cloak as well if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Uh, so he's kind of talking about uh, retaliation and not not seeking revenge, not seeking payback, um, not retaliating. And so Bierman's three things here are non-retaliation, self-sacrifice, and turning the other cheek. And people said, oh, it's writing against self-defense. And I don't think that's a fair characterization of it. And I would say, I don't know if that's a fair characterization of Jesus' teaching either. He's, because he's, he's saying, don't retaliate, right? If someone, the whole, the trope, they sent one of yours to the hospital, send one of theirs to the morgue. Like, he's like, don't do that. Um, but where I, and again, Ben, maybe you can provide some clarity here, is the issue of self-defense, right? We're not supposed to retaliate, but are we within our, is it faithful for us to defend ourselves? And I think this is where Bierman's acknowledgement that this is like a murky area comes into play because I think, and this is kind of where I'm starting to settle, I think it entirely depends on why. If you are def like, 
if you're defending yourself just for the sake of your convenience or something, I would say, well, maybe that's not appropriate. But like if I'm walking somewhere with my wife and someone is coming up and he's threatening my wife, I think it is part of my or or not even it doesn't even have to be my wife if it's a friend or if there are some kids with me or or even if I see this happening to a stranger. It's part of my calling to stick to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves that's that's a scriptural thing. Um, God reveals that a lot throughout the Old Testament because he expects Israel to defend the widowed and the fatherless and, and people who can't stand up for themselves so like. If someone pulls a, a knife on my wife, I'm I'm gonna do something about it as as much as I am able. Um, so, and when you when it comes to self defense, like if I'm gonna defend myself, I'm thinking like it's if it's just for me, that's one thing. But the reality is like if I am, let's take this to an extreme. If I die. That makes it much, much harder for my, like, who's going to take care of my family? Who's going to take care of the church that I lead? Who's, go, who's going to step into these vocations? So on some level, I think self, like, if you're being a good steward of the time and the talents that God has given you, I, I think sometimes self-defense is necessary because you have roles to play. So that's why I'm kind of thinking it's it's a very like where you come down on it is going to depend on so much on the context who you are why you're defending yourself what is actually being threatened against you and all this to say i don't think this article is is really about self-defense i don't think that's that, that wasn't Bierman's point at all um huh? now that i've thrown all that out there so what I, do we think ben <laughs> so it seems to me that a lot of the controversy uh surrounds kind of an insinuation that comes out of some of Bierman's opening statements. Um, that is like what the purpose of, as Luther writes or, or calls it the sword, uh, the use of violence. Um, there's seems to be from Jesus a reasonable prohibition against the use of violence. Uh, in in most circumstances, um, and the exceptions given are that somebody's got to have the ability to use force to uphold justice, so the sword is given to the state, and God, as creator of the world, the one who established His will, uh, who and en who enacts justice has the ability to use the sword when and where he wills. Um, and beyond that, Bierman doesn't really see a use for the sword in the world. So where does that leave self-defense? And I think that's kind of where a lot of the controversy is, because it seems to be off the bat, Bierman saying the only people who are allowed to use force to uphold justice are the government and God. So here's a question for you, and I'm, I'm butting in here because I think it directly plays to what you're driving here. Um, because something else Bierman talks about is it's it's the government, it's the state, and then those who are let's say deputized by them yeah, right so so like it. so like a soldier would be an agent of the state and my question because so is this is the morality of self-defense is this one of the few instances where legality defines morality if the government says you you can defend yourself in this situation do you, uh, on some think, level, become an agent of the government when you are defending yourself within their bounds, within the bounds that they have set? I think that's kind of where he ends up landing, yeah. Um, within scripture, the examples that we see for 
self-defense as close as it gets to being defined in scripture mm -hmm. um in the the mosaic law there are a couple of provisions for using lethal force to stop crimes in progress um and the the clearest example of that is an intruder in your house um if someone breaks into your house in the middle of the day the the logic was they are likely assuming that you're out in the field and they meant you no harm they just want to steal your stuff because they're desperate you're not allowed to use legal force in that in that situation lethal because they were not um did i say legal you did say legal i don't know what i said Okay. You said legal. I meant to it's say lethal. I meant to say, yeah, I meant to say lethal. You're not allowed to use lethal force in that situation, according to Mosaic law, because the purpose was not to kill you. The flip side of that, if the intruder enters your home at night, chances are he knows that you're there, and he has no regard for your life. If he's going to take property, if he's going to take your life, he's going to do it at night. So if an, intruder, if an intruder enters your home at night, according to Mosaic law, you have the right to defend yourself and use lethal force. I don't think that necessarily perfectly applies to the way that we're called to use self-defense now. But it sets a precedent on some I think level. it does. It does a little bit. And it says two things. One, the emphasis in... Uh, mosaic law was not on self-defense it was on defense of the rest of your family so if the intruder came in, in in the evening you should dispatch them so that they are not able to harm your family you're putting your own life on the line to stop them so your life is already kind of forfeit you are doing this for your your family or your neighbor in this particular circumstance. Um, so that's one. And two, um, that use of force was allowable at that time in that place because of the system that they had set up. It was not like this is to be for all time your standard it was this is what we're doing because we have this system in place um above and beyond this it is not your your responsibility to to kill intruders like there was not an exception made um to kill someone who stole your sheep um they were then sentenced to work for you rather than you killing them. Um, yeah, most of the Old Testament law with property was essentially, they have to, they have to like recoup the expenses that you lost. Is, is yeah. Most of it boils down to just that. They have to yeah. pay you back. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so that-, that Which is I gotta be honest, I would prefer because there is this guy in Florida who stole my laptop and he got arrested and went to prison I, it wasn't just my laptop. He stole, like, he broke into dozens of cars and, and stole a bunch of people's stuff. Honestly, I would have preferred that he have to pay me for the window, pay me back to have the window fixed, and, and replace the laptop and the, the stuff he stole. I would have preferred that for him going to prison, and I bet he would have learned his lesson because it would have been an expensive lesson. Just saying. Just saying. Um, yeah. I think the only other exception is like to stop a rape in progress. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the only other exception for youth, use of legal fo lethal force to legally stop a uh, crime in progress. In the um, Old Testament. In the Old Testament. That's it. Like if if the the life of someone around you, a neighbor of yours, is threatened. You are to lay your life on the line to protect them. That's it. That's self-defense under, under the scriptures. 
And within that, it never says that you need to own a sword or anything to do that. In fact, God often limited or tried to limit uh, Israel's military might so that they were reliant on him for their victory in battle. He set limits on the number of chariots that they were allowed to have and horses they were allowed to have. He instructed the kings that they were never to count their population so that they never knew the number of men they had at their disposal. And they were instead reliant on God's uh, protection and provision for them in the midst of battle. Um, far, far beyond any sort of, of instruction to, to arm, God repeatedly enforced that he wanted the people to rely on him for their protection and for their justice. That it was not to be theirs to be doled out. Um, and that's why, like, throughout the campaigns in the book of Judges, or uh, book of Joshua, excuse me, when the people failed, it was because they tried to take things into their own hands. When the people turned to God, they succeeded. Um, throughout the book of Judges, you see multiple examples of where God uses um, underwhelming odds to deliver his victory, not overwhelming odds. He doesn't say to Gideon and the 300 men, you know, arm yourself to the teeth and come with tanks. He says, come with a torch and a pot and a trumpet. I'm going to drive them into madness for you. Like, Which let's, let's remember that Gideon had 300 men. He started out with a much larger force and yeah. God kept sending them home. Yes. Yep. He's like, oh, you have too many guys. Uh, send some of them home. They, they, yep. they look tired. They need a nap. <laughs> oh, they didn't drink water the right way. Send them home. They're not, they're not ready for this. Yeah. Oh, no, the yeah. First you only have 300 was... guys. You go for it. First group was, are you scared? Go home. <laughs> Chicken <poka. laughs> Um The rest of them. How they liars. explain that to the people at home? They get home. Why are you back so soon? I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> um but all of that to me points to like it is not our responsibility to be armed to the teeth and at no point does god like guarantee us the opportunity to have a weapon so if if the united states government were to come along and say yeah not josh's guns uh they can't take those that'd be well they could they just have to amputate my arms yeah but at that point they'd be sinning and you can you can stop that, I think. I think Unless they already got my arms, then. Yeah, then you should turn then it. Then it's too late. Yeah. Um, I got no arms left. Tis but a flesh wound. Um, tis but a flesh wound. <laughs> Sorry, circling back on the on the train of thought here. Um, so if the if the United States government were to ban people from privately owning firearms there is nothing in scripture that tells us that we should object to that yes i i want to moderate that a little bit because there i don't think there's anything in scripture that says we we couldn't work within the structures of the government to resist it right so like writing letters to your representative whatever mm -hmm. like right so when it comes to the second amendment I'm, I'm eating venison for dinner tonight because my grandpa shot it in the fall um i come from a hunting family i'm not saying that we should get rid of all of our guns like if you hunt if you sport shoot like i have no problem with that i in circum certain circumstances don't necessarily have problems with having firearms for for, for protective reasons either especially for people that live out in the middle of nowhere um but 
So I like, think biblically speaking, as far as the Second Amendment is concerned, it's a neutral, it's a wash. Yes. I would say you can't use scripture to defend the Second Amendment, but you also can't use scripture to uh, advocate for its repeal, if that makes sense. I think if you're being honest, scripture is like, well, mm -hmm. it would be, it depends way too much on how you use the weapon. Uh -huh. Because when it comes down to it, they are just tools. Uh -huh. we guns, weapons of any form, they're just tools, and it depends on who is using them. Uh -huh. um, so, because, like, personally, I look at it, and I am, I am very much, the argument to me is very convincing that by making guns illegal, the only people you take guns away from are the people who use them legally. Um. And that, like, that's a convincing argument for me, because if, if you're intent on doing bad things, laws are not going to stop you, because if laws stopped you, you wouldn't do the bad things anyway. Um, but scripture has nothing to do with that. That's just me and my logic, which may or may not be flawed, right? I'm, I'm a flawed human being, just like everybody else, so... Um, but to circle back to the also article, for like, every argument. go ahead. I was just going to say, for, for every argument that we can come up with logically for it, like, there's also the logical argument. There's no such thing as a good guy with a gun. Uh, we're all sinners with guns. Oh, like, yeah, well. <laughs> like, yeah. There are, there are so many stories of, of people accidentally mishandling weapons. Even the most, you know, uh, experienced firearms experts. Um, Not Keanu and... Reeves, though. <laughs> but yes to Alec Baldwin. Um... Yikes. I knew you were going to go there. As soon as I said Keanu Reeves, I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> um, that's, anyway. Professionals um, have that's, standards, that's all... Ben. I guess that You're makes right. us amateurs. And this, This is... This is where we kind of get back to, well, who has God given the sword to? God has given the sword to government and to himself. It is his responsibility to enact justice, and he's delegated part of that responsibility to civil authorities in the world. Um, and it, within the world, if civil authorities say, sure, you're allowed to own firearms to protect yourself, then as Christians, we can. Doesn't necessarily mean we should, and we should be incredibly uh, oh, what's discerning. discerning as to when we use them. Yeah, um, we should be incredibly discerning as to when we use them. But I don't think Scripture would necess necessarily say we can't. But we should be using them for the sake of neighbor and not for our own sake. Yeah, you know, um, which is like, circling back to the article. I, that's kind of just what Bierman says. And uh -huh. again, I don't know what people are getting so upset about. I don't it's know the I, same thing we I talked think, about last week. I with, guess uh, like you hear the subtext, even if it's not there. Because we've been uh -huh. so trained to listen and to I the think, subtext. Actually, I think I might know where this is coming from. Because within that argument, though, there's also the, the opening. If the, if the sword is only given to God and to the government, or as Luther writes it, to God and to the princes, then the princes have every right to say you're not allowed to own weapons for self-defense purposes. And as Christians, we would have to respond, okay. If the government makes that decision, we have to be okay with that. And there are going to, like, I think that's where a lot of people were upset because our, our society and our culture has trained us. We have to be prepared for everything. And that means 
being able to combat everything that the world is going to throw at us with equal or or more force um like i feel like every year the minnesota vikings end the season and go our offensive line wasn't big enough or strong enough so they draft some 340 pound hulking behemoth of a human who gets injured in week two and the line is right back where it was the previous season um most secure job in football, the second string of the Minnesota Vikings offensive line. Yes, absolutely. But the, the point there being, like, our response to being overpowered is always to use more force. It's just an underappreciation for the rogue archetype. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, but I think if we look at things scripturally, if we look at things biblically, that is not necessarily our calling. And even to the point of that's never guaranteed. Um, do we have those rights and privileges here in the United States as a part of our, our civic privileges and rights? Yes. Is it part of our theological privileges and rights? Not necessarily. Are we still allowed to defend ourselves? Sure. Use the, the uh, novelty baseball bat you got the last baseball game you went to to defend your home. Like, the no I'm picturing a baseball bat it. the size of this pen when you say novelty baseball bat. I, I'm going to get you. It's like half size. I mean, sure. But like. <laughs> what are you going to do? Poke their eyes out with it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll bite your ankles off. Um, <laughs> wow, two Monty Python second. references in one episode. We're doing we're doing yeah. something right. Yep, absolutely. Um, but I think that's where a lot of the controversy is coming from is just insinuating this this idea that we don't have a right to arm ourselves to the teeth. And I think that's a lot. I think that's hard for a lot of people to hear. Um, and I know there are Christians who will defend that argument with, I can't remember in which gospel it is. I want to say it's in Luke's gospel where Jesus tells his disciples sitting at the to table. buy a sword, yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who will use that as, as um, evidence that Christians should be armed and prepared to defend ourselves. But I don't think that that was the purpose of Jesus's words there. I think Jesus was trying to point to the sinful hypocrisy of the disciples, that they were not prepared to, to go into the world and to serve God. They were terrified. Because he tells them, like, go buy a sword, sell your cloak, take your coin purse, buy a sword. They got no. Why would we do that? We already have one. He goes, yeah, that's proof enough. I'm because looking at what passage. happened. What happens like a chapter or two later? They're in the garden. Peter lops off a guy's ear. Jesus rebukes him. Jesus's life is on the line there. Jesus rebukes Peter for cutting off the guy's ear, heals the guy, and submits to the government. I'm I'm trying to find the passage unsuccessfully. Okay. Yeah, Kim, I want to say it's in either Matthew or Luke's gospel. It's Luke 22, um, but Luke 22 is a really long chapter. Bear with me, Joe. Okay. Um, it's going to be shortly before, shortly before they leave for the garden. Because Jesus also ties that particular... And he um, said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. And he said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, 
and a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. He was numbered with the transgressors. Uh, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said, it is enough. Um, so, I mean, I would say that he's just instructing them to be ready to go out into the world. Like you could even read that as like you're going on the road, literally on the road. If you have to deal with wild, wild animals on the way, you should be prepared for that or something. Um, yeah, I, that, that would be a I soft think even text. Like, I think even his response to it, though, is telling because they they go to find swords and and uh, Luke's response is to lean into the fact that he had to be numbered amongst transgressors, right? Yeah. The Lu so the Lutheran Study Bible just explains travelers common ca commonly carried swords or large knives, and then it is enough. Jesus ends the discussion. I don't know. I read that and I, I think it has nothing to do with this conversation. It's uh, Jesus is so like if someone was say, oh, well, Jesus says we should be armed. It's like, yeah, in case you got to deal with wild animals as you're walking to a different city. <coughs> but uh, in any case. Yeah. Anyway, all of this is to say, again. It depends. It's not it there's a lot that depends our our ability to own firearms is never never mentioned in scripture like so we need to be willing to listen to the government that god has placed over us um and we need to be willing to lay down our lives for the sake of our neighbors i think that's the realities of self-defense to read too much into it beyond that might be might be sinful definitely is a stretch um, but like don't let culture convince you that it is your god given right to own a weapon it is your god given right to love god and serve neighbor Anything above and beyond that is a human construction. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of in closing, uh, again, still don't know what people like. There's there's no real reason theologically to get upset with the articles found in this uh, annotated copy of the large catechism. Um, I'll try and remember to put a link to it in the description for these these podcasts or these videos. So if you're in, it's 20 bucks on Amazon if you're interested and want to read through them. Um, I thought at least the articles I've read so far were pretty good. Um, but uh, unless you have more, I think we're ready to move into takeaways. Are we good with that? Got the head shake for those of you listening. Um, I think my takeaway that we're recording a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I think my takeaway from all this is is you just you have to you have to judge any given situation based on the situation, right? To make blanket statements about this stuff isn't really helpful as much as uh, to have some principles to operate on. So to succinctly put that, the principle is we're called to serve our, to, to protect and serve our neighbor. So do that. Ben? I think if I had, if I have one takeaway from this, I bet it's going to be spicy. Ben's feeling spicy today. 
This is my biggest takeaway. It's remember what we have been given. Remember the responsibilities that we've been given. To above all things, love God and serve neighbor. Those are our God-given rights. And our freedom lies within that. And we can't conflate, confuse the freedoms that we have as citizens of the United States or Canada or Brazil or wherever you're listening to this podcast with the rights of a Christian. Because they're not always the same. And the more we can do to distinguish those, the more that we can do to make sure that we're mindful of those. I think the better it will serve us in a lot of these conversations. And the better we will be able to approach disagreements around a lot of political issues like whether we can own guns, whether we should own guns. We'll come come at those conversations with a lot more patience and grace if we remember what they are in the context of the world we live in. Yeah. Um... So if you if you know someone who's struggling with with some part of this topic or you think this podcast would be helpful to them, go ahead and send them a link. Um, and uh, if you're listening to this because someone sent you a link, good on you for listening to the stuff that your friend sends you. Because I I don't always do that when people point me to different things. So uh, congrats, pat yourself on the back and. Uh, after you're done patting yourself on the back, you can go ahead and subscribe to this podcast. Uh, and regardless of why you're listening to this particular episode, go ahead and subscribe to our podcast. We appreciate it. It, uh, it lets us know that we're not just talking to ourselves here. And uh, we are on all the major podcasting platforms. So Apple, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, Podbean, etc. And we'd love, we'd love to see those numbers go up. And uh, we also have a Facebook page. Like it if you want. We don't really care. It's mostly there. So if you need to reach out to us, but you don't know us personally, you can do that. We love topic suggestions. We love uh, guest suggestions. We will do our best to, uh, to accommodate those. And if you would like to come on for an episode, we can certainly find some space for you. We love talking to people, um, especially people from different backgrounds than us so uh because we'll be back. at some point talking to a bunch of pastors gets pretty boring yeah we'll be back next week with uh, our study of corinthians we thank you for bearing with us through these couple of weeks uh and accommodating us as we come at you with something a little different bearing with us we're a joy ben what are you talking about i mean oh <laughs> <laughs> With that, we'll hear brothers and sisters, next week. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's definitely a delay on that video, man. It's killing me.